Hi, everybody. Oh, I like that. That was a good welcome. I appreciate that. Thank you all for coming to our, our kickoff, you know, for uh, the Lakewood Community Services Center. Uh, Trish explained who we are, what we're doing. Uh, my name is Matt Fish. I'm the owner and founder of Melt Bar and Grilled. Um, anybody been to Melt before? Show of hands. Thank you all for your support. Who hasn't been there? Why haven't you? I'm just kidding. So. If you're not familiar, um, we are in downtown Lakewood. We are at the corner of Detroit and Warren, uh, which is considered downtown Lakewood. Um, it was our first store, it's our, my flagship location. We opened up there in 2006. If you're not familiar with who we are, what we do, we are a gourmet grilled cheese restaurant. We do everything fresh uh, from signature, signature recipes that I created or my culinary team created. Um, when I opened up in 2006, I was a much younger man. It was uh, 16 years ago now. And I had a vision. I wanted to do something very different, very fun, very unique. Um, I lived in Lakewood at the time, and I was really focused on doing something for my community. Uh, the community of Lakewood, first of all, really supported us, which was huge. I really wanted to get my local community to support me in the restaurant. But Fortunately, we got a lot of good press right away. Uh, people really enjoyed what we were doing and it kind of took off. And then in 2010, we had an opportunity to start expanding. We've got 10 locations spread out through all of Ohio. We're in Greater Cleveland, we're in Canton, we're in Akron, we're in Columbus, we're in Dayton. We have a location actually inside the park at Cedar Point, which is really cool. Um, Progressive Field downtown where the Cleveland Guardians play. We actually have a little kiosk in there where we do a couple sandwiches for the ball games when baseball season is around. And then uh, Case Western Reserve, which is over on the east side. Um, we actually, we, we are in the student center over there. So we service the students, we service the facu faculty, and then anybody in that area can actually come in. So I've been busy the last 16 years is, is my point. So, uh, but not busy enough to give back. I mean, I love Lakewood, I love the community. I started here, um, no matter how big or small the company is, Lakewood's always gonna be our home. It's gonna be our flagship location. But this whole thing, uh, Trish gave you guys a little bit of background. What we're doing is we're starting a, um, a cooking demonstration series. Um, it's geared towards seniors, but really it's geared towards everybody. What we're doing is we're trying to have an initiative where we're developing, uh, we're bringing in very simple, easy to prepare, delicious and healthy meals for anybody um, and low cost as well. So what I'm making for you guys and the recipe card that you're holding that you can obviously take home and try if you'd like, or better yet, go to Melt and buy it. Um, hot little plug, see, see what I did there? Uh, we're making our roasted garlic tomato soup. It's a fun recipe, it's a very easy recipe. I think it's a delicious recipe, also very healthy. Um, if anybody has any dietary concerns, there is zero dairy in this recipe. There is zero, zero meat products in this recipe, so it's uh, considered vegan. Um, this recipe could actually may, be made fat-free. I'm not gonna make it fat-free today. I'm gonna use a little bit of uh, vegetable oil. Uh, kind of a blended oil between vegetable and uh, olive oil to saute my vegetables in our pan right here. And you can also add tons of things to it. So you can add cheese to it. You can add cream to it. You can add a protein like a chicken, a grilled chicken, a pulled meat product. You can add other vegetables to it. It's a, you'll see as I'm making it, um, it's a delicious soup, but it's a, it's a blank canvas. So if you are going to try this at home, whether you're here in the audience today or watching this on video, you know, get crazy, because this soup really can be as mild as you want or it can be as wild as you want. It is actually a thicker tomato soup. It's not typically like, uh, like a store-bought tomato soup. It's a lot thicker, it's a lot heartier. Um, it actually has some um, similarities to a marinara. So I've actually used it for a marinara at times um, in a pinch. So it's a very versatile sauce. So this recipe could be key. You guys could use it for a ton of things. Um, it holds very well. If you make it today, the tomato product, the acid, there's a high content of acid in tomatoes, so you're gonna get a long shelf life out of it. Um, I would easily say you'd get 30 to 45 days under refrigeration out of this soup, um, or potentially longer. So, again, it goes a very long way. But, cool story about this soup is, this was actually the first recipe that I developed for Melt Bar and Grilled. So, we had the restaurant ready to go. Everything was built, tables and chairs, staff hired, everybody trained, we're ready to go. And then I actually did not open for another two weeks. What I did in the two weeks before we grand opened is I locked myself in the building in the kitchen and I actually developed 
myself all the recipes that became the first menu at Melt Barn Grilled. And a lot of the recipes have still stuck after 16 years and have not changed much since. So this roasted garlic tomato soup was the very first recipe that I developed for Melt Barn Grill because I told you guys before, if you're familiar with Melt, we are a gourmet grilled cheese restaurant. What goes great with grilled cheese? Tomato soup, correct. So I had to have a killer signature tomato soup, so I developed this soup. And the reason it's not thin, like a typical tomato soup you might find in a restaurant setting or open up a can, pour it, drink, you know, eat it, is I wanted the tomato soup to have cling ability. So if I'm dipping my bread or I'm dipping my sandwich into the tomato soup and I'm taking it out, the entire sandwich is coated. Like that soup is not dripping off. It is sticking to that sticking to that sandwich, sticking to that bread. So this soup does wonders with a nice crusty French bread and an Italian bread. This, this soup and this recipe is very near and dear to my heart because I distinctly remember locking myself in, in the doors inside Melt Barn Grill back in 2006 before I opened up, developing all the recipes for the, for the, for the, for the, for the uh, reci, re, restaurant, sorry, and not knowing what tomorrow was gonna bring. I had no idea whether we were gonna be successful or not successful. I had no idea if the soup was gonna be good or the soup was gonna be bad. I had no idea if people were gonna like us or not. So fortunately, it all worked out because I'm standing up here 16 years later showing you guys the recipe and giving you my silly little story. So, but you're probably like, Matt, just make the soup already, okay? Stop talking, stop telling us, stop telling these stories. So, um, so thank you guys all for coming. I'm not sure if I thanked you ahead of time. So I really appreciate your time and your, your attention. Um, we're gonna jump into making the soup. So it's a little bit of a, I don't, I don't wanna say non-traditional way of, of making soup, but I'm sure, um, hopefully everyone here is, has made soup, has a little bit of a restaurant, or not restaurant background, but a little bit of a cooking knowledge. If not, don't worry about it, you don't have to. I'm gonna talk you through it a little bit. So traditionally when you're making soup, um, you're gonna start with chopping vegetables, sauteing vegetables, you know, making a mirepoix, which a mirepoix is celery, carrots, and onions. So which we have all three, we have carrots, we have celery, we have onions. Typically, if you were making a chunky soup, like, it's like a chicken noodle soup is a great example. So you know what a finished product looks like when you're making chicken noodle soup. You know, it's chunky, lots of pulled chicken in there, big carrots, big onions, big celery. You wanna see all that stuff in there. And that's that type of soup, obviously. This tomato soup, I wanted to be very thin. I did not wanna see anything in there except for the tomato product. Well, how do you achieve that? and still get all the flavors, because I want the flavors from this mirepoix, these carrots, celery, and onions, but I don't want to see them in my soup. So what we do is we start with a food processor, and we actually take the raw product and we put it into a food processor, we process it until it's pulverized, and then we actually add it to the soup, and then once the soup cooks together, everything kind of melds, melts, pun intended, melts into the soup. So, I've got onions here that are already pre-chopped. And, and the measurements I'm doing here are almost exactly to the measurements you guys have on your recipe cards. Um, so we should yield about a gallon of soup-ish. You technically don't have to do this. This is how I like to make the soup because I want it to be thin. You can dice these up as small as you can by hand with a simple knife and you can make the soup and it's gonna turn out exactly the same. The flavors are gonna be exactly the same. The consistency won't be exactly the same, but you know, I, I'm hoping no one's stealing my recipe and gonna go open up their own restaurant and use my tomato soup. So I'm trusting you guys that you're not gonna do that. So you, you're, there's many different ways to make this soup. This is how I like to make it and it's, a, it's an alternative. And you can take this and you can kind of use it to make any type of soup. But this is a, this is a smoother soup, so I'm gonna run this Roboku in any sort of food processor, any sort of blender. If you have a stick blender at home, like we're gonna use here in a little bit, this works as well. A knife and a cutting board, chopping as small as possible work. Or make this a chunky soup. You know, turn it into like a, um, a minestrone type soup, you know? Like, simple, whatever, it's to your flavor. So I'm gonna turn this on. I'm just gonna puree this down a little bit. I'm just gonna let that run for a second. All right, so I'm gonna take now my celery, I'm gonna cut it up. Since I'm pureeing it, I really don't have to make this pretty. So I'm gonna add my celery now to here. Onions have a lot of water in them, as you guys probably realize or know. So I'm gonna utilize the onions in here with the water and celery also has a lot of water, but it's a little drier than the onion is, so I'm gonna use that to help me puree that down. 
I'm gonna do the same thing with my carrots. I'm gonna cut these a little bit smaller. All right, so that's working good. Turn that off, excellent. So now I'm gonna utilize all this goodness that's in here. Use, utilize the liquid, because liquid is your friend when you're using a food processor. If you guys have ever tried to process anything that's very dry, it's very difficult. So I'm gonna utilize all that. This might take a couple, a couple extra seconds here. Kind of see all that getting all getting working in there. Break those carrots down. The carrots are the one I'm really concerned about. I really want to break those carrots down when I'm pureeing stuff. The celery and the and the onions, even if I didn't do a full puree puree, or if, even if I chopped them as small as I could get them and sauteed them, they're gonna they're gonna end up end up getting very soft and almost disappearing in the soup. Because we're gonna blend the soup at the end to smooth it out. But those carrots. Those carrots are gonna be more difficult to hide. So you can, you can really see, see that color change pretty quick. All right, so we're good there. So I've got my whole mixture here. I've got a hot pan here, I've got a little oil in there. So I'm just gonna start sauteing this stuff up. So you have to bear with me. This is the first time I'm using this, this cooktop here. It's not an open flame like I'm used to using. It's, uh, it's kind of like an electric burner. So I'm not positive if it's hot enough, if it's not hot enough. So if I burn down the new community center, I apologize in advance. <laughs> Except there's no flame, so it would be impossible to burn it down. Chad, sorry. OK, so I've got my onions. My celery and my carrots in here, pureed. So I wanna, I'm gonna add this to my pot. I'm gonna cook this down slightly. I just really wanna get it hot, get it heated up. The, the true cooking process is gonna happen when I add the tomato product. I think on the recipe card, on the back is the roasted garlic recipe. Am I correct in saying that? Cool, very simple. Has anybody ever roasted garlic before? It's fantastic. I love garlic. I'm a big garlic fan. I love spicy food. Um, I love large flavors, and to me, garlic is a very large flavor, so I love it. If you have any irritation or aversity to an onion or a garlic, if you think, oh, it's too pugnant, it's too flavorful, I'm not really into that, roasting garlic actually smooths it out a lot and makes it a lot more tolerable, even to sensitive palates. Um, very aromatic, very flavorful. Um, it's probably in a lot of things that you've eaten before in restaurants or at home um, or somebody's made you something and you really can't identify what that flavor is. Like a lot of people put roasted garlic in mashed potatoes, which is fantastic. Um, that roasted, ro roasted garlic recipe is incredibly simple. Again, it has a very long shelf life um, in a, under refrigeration. Um, probably definitely a couple weeks, I'd say 30 to 45 days at least. Um, very simple. I've got our, this is our finished product right here, if you guys can see that. We take whole cloves of garlic, and then we put them with olive oil, vegetable oil, a little bit of salt and pepper, cover them in a, in, on a, either a baking pan, a sheet tray, uh, any kind of oven safe vessel. Um, I've even used, you can even use a pot just like this if it fits in your oven, or a saute pan if it's oven safe. Anything will work. Um, very simple recipe. Um, you can, I can puree this, I can keep this whole. Um, we actually have it whole today, but um, I've done demos like this where the roasted garlic is also pureed. Um, any recipe that calls for regular garlic, you can always sub roasted garlic. I wouldn't add this to the saute pan. I wouldn't add this to this right now when I'm sauteing or if you're sauteing vegetables. I would wait until there's some sort of liquid in there because this is already a cooked product. It's already finished. It's very flavorful. That's gonna be a great component of this soup. Obviously, roasted garlic tomato soup. I can't make roasted garlic tomato soup without the roasted garlic, right? But let's say hypothetically you don't like garlic and you still wanna make this soup. Can work, it can work. You can cut way back on the garlic. Maybe you uh, start making the soup and you add the garlic at the end, little by little, and then you start to just taste it and you get to that point where, okay, it's in there, I can taste it, but it's not overwhelming. You know, that's my cooking style. Um, that's where this soup and every other recipe at Melt kind of comes from. 
Um, but if, like I said, if you have an aversion to garlic, you can take completely omit it or just add it a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. Um, to be honest with you, that's how I developed a lot of these recipes. So you got this recipe card. If you want to make this at home without garlic, add a little bit, write it down. I added one tablespoon. Oh, I added another tablespoon, another tablespoon. That's plenty. Cool. Now I'm going to rewrite this recipe and it's just going to call for three tablespoons of roasted garlic instead of almost a cup. Okay, so we're going to, our, our vegetable mirepoix, our, which is pureed, is ready to go. So now I'm going to add my dry spices. Um, I've got um, just very simple dry spices. We first start with kosher salt. I've got black pepper. And these are all simple spices you can find in any grocery store. You probably have the majority of these in your pantry at home already. A crushed red pepper seeds, sorry, crushed red pepper seeds. That adds a little bit of heat, a little bit of flavor to it. Again, if you have any aversion to spice, if you have any aversion to pepper, you can omit that. Um, ground rosemary, which adds a very good flavor to the soup, very aromatic. One bay leaf, which we're gonna put in there while we cook it, and then we're gonna we're take it out. So let's talk kosher salt for a second. I said I used kosher salt in here. If you don't have kosher salt, use iodine salt. Any salt's gonna work. You can use sea salt, you can use pink sea salt, you can use black sea salt, you can use, most, I would read, you know, most salts you buy in the grocery store or you have um, are interchangeable. Just the amounts are a little bit different, so you might wanna look online and say, okay, the recipe calls for kosher salt. I only have iodine table salt at home. What's the ratio? All right, so I'm gonna add my roasted garlic now and heat that up. And again, that doesn't, it does not need to be whole. I just put it in here whole. You can puree it ahead of time and add it. Just might save you a little bit of a step. All right, so I'm gonna move into tomato land. I'm gonna start with my tomato juice. Everybody's pretty familiar with tomato juice. Um, canned product, can be, can be a fresh product at the grocery store, but canned is fine. So we're pouring that in there just because I want to cool this down a little bit because it's really getting hot and bubbly. So tomato juice is the first tomato product that's in there. So we're going to work that around a little bit. I want to get that heated back up again. So it's thinning out. It's very good. Really can't, really aren't pulling out any distinct veggies in there. We're going to let it cook for a little bit here. Uh, tomato juice, I'm not, I'm not necessarily going to say tomato juice is tomato juice, um, but anything you're going to find at one of the local grocery stores is probably fine. The more expensive tomato juice does not necessarily better than the cheapest tomato juice that's out there. Um, the one thing I caution you with is to, with tomato products is that a lot of the cheaper alternative tomato products, and there's not a drastic difference in the grocery store between this brand name and this generic brand. However, some of the generic brands or the cheaper brands have a tendency to add sugar to their products. The better the tomato, typically the sweeter and the more natural sugars that are in the tomato, the lesser quality tomato, the typically it's a little bit less sweet and um, Americans like us love sweet things. So manufacturers have a tendency to add sugar to it. So it might be a little unhealthy, it's, the soup is essentially going to probably come out exactly the same. Um, it just depends on what you're looking for. So the last, but not least, because it's probably the most important recipe, eh, next to the roasted garlic, I would say that this is probably, the tomato product is probably the most important aspect of roasted garlic tomato soup. This is ground tomato. Uh, it's, it's very similar to a crushed tomato that you're going to see in the grocery store. Uh, crushed tomatoes um, is the main ingredient to any Italian marinara or spaghetti sauce or sauce that you're going to be familiar with. Uh, my first, one of my first restaurant jobs, I grew up in Parma, and one of my first restaurant jobs was at a small little Italian pizza shop and, and restaurant um, near where I grew up in Parma. And the woman that owned it was first generation Italian here in America. And I was very fortunate because she's a very nice woman. She took me under her wing and really showed me how to cook the proper, her, her take on, on proper Italian food. Um, and I learned a lot from that woman. And it really probably working at that restaurant probably 
I, not probably, it did. It really changed my path in life and, and took me from not knowing what the heck I wanted to do right out of high school to actually saying, I'm going to go to culinary school and I'm going to work in a restaurant. So we've got all of our product in here. Um, again, that, that ground tomato product is very similar to a crushed tomato. It's probably going to be called a crushed tomato uh, at the grocery store. Um, it's not going to be thin like a tomato soup. It's not going to be a tomato sauce that you can buy. It's going to have some chunk to it. Typically, a crushed tomato is going to have the skin already removed. So the tomatoes are going to be blanched. The skin's going to be removed. And you're just going to have, basically, if I was taking Roma tomatoes and I took the skin off of them and I crushed them with my hands and I put them in that, in that jar and I sealed it up, that's exactly what I'm going to buy off the grocery store. I'm just going to let this cook for, a, for just a couple seconds. I really just want to get a, maybe like a little boil out of it. Um, and then what we're going to do next is I've got a stick blender. So we're going to use the stick blender in a couple minutes in here and we're going to blend this soup inside the pot. What that's going to do is any stray pieces from, the, from the, my food processor that maybe didn't get chopped up enough, that are now cooked and soft, I'm going to puree those up so the, so the soup is nice and smooth. Um, if you, if you remember when I added the roasted garlic, it was chunks of roasted garlic. It was already cooked and already roasted, so it was very soft. It's probably going to break itself up on its own in here, but I'm going to make sure with this stick blender that, um, that it's nice and smooth. But thirdly, the most important reason I'm going to use a stick blender is I want to incorporate some air into this soup. And what that will do is it'll give it a velvety mouthfeel. It's going to lighten the soup up. The, the, the color of the soup is actually going to change. It's, the, it's, it's a nice dark red right now. It's going to lighten up slightly um, and it's going to give it a little bit better of a sheen and a bit, little better of a look. And I can achieve that without having to add any cream to the soup. If I add cream to the soup, it's obviously going to, obviously going to smooth it out. It's going to give it a different type of mouthfeel. It's going to be a little velvetier. It's going to add some fat components to this soup. You're more than welcome to add cream to this soup. Your heavy cream, uh, half and half, milk, all those things will work. Um, then, you, then it's going to be more of a kind of a blush type soup. But we incorporate that, we get that kind of look and that feel with the hand blender. So um, now that we're talking about it, I might as well just do it, right? So, <clears throat> so I'm just going to put it in there. I'm going to go up and down a little bit just so I can get all the pieces parts. So you kind of get the soup moving a little bit. These things are powerful. But if you're making stuff at home, if you have any culinary ability or you have aspirations to get have culinary ability, having a stick blender is cool. But a regular blender works just the same. The soup is really taken on a smoother texture for sure. The color has changed, not dramatically, but it's changed. And I'm just going to let it cook down a little bit. You guys see how thick it is, though? Very non-traditional tomato soup. Questions, comments, concerns? It didn't. I screwed up. You caught me. I should have taken that bay leaf out before I, before I pureed it. I was hoping that no one would catch me. I'm just kidding. You should, and you should take it out. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm not going to hurt anybody today, I promise. What? No, no, I pureed it with that, with that blender. It's in there. I might be able to pull it out. I was hoping. That's why I kept stirring this soup. I was hoping that nobody would catch it. Thank you. They're in there for flavor. They're not necessarily in there to eat. The bay leaf is under that same like, um, jurisdiction where it's really not edible. Um, it is now. Come on, we live, through, we live through the pandemic. Okay, I don't think a bay leaf is going to hurt us. Let's be honest here. No, it, there was one, one bay leaf in a gallon of soup is not, I, I guarantee, is not going to hurt anybody. And it's not, there's nothing wrong with eating it. It's not going to physically hurt you. There's just, there's really no nutritional value to it. It's a flavor. It's a, it's like a, it's a hard leaf. So it, it's, I pureed the heck out of it, so it's gone. But... If there was a piece of it left, or if you got the bay leaf, like when, when my mom, when we were growing up, made the tomato sauce and we got the bay leaf, sometimes you didn't see it until it was in your mouth and you pull it out. So if anybody does find the bay leaf, then you win the prize. You win the, 
My mother will be very happy to hear that. That's about it. Fun soup. I think it's delicious. It's very versatile. Like I said, it goes fantastic with, tomato, with, with um, grilled cheese because that's what it was designed around. It was designed to be a component um, or an accompaniment to a grilled cheese sandwich. But like I said, fantastic pasta sauce. A lot of good flavors in here. The roasted garlic is very strong, very pronounced. Great bread dipper. It's really good. It's a versatile soup. It lasts a long time in your refrigerator, so you can make it today. You can be eating this and utilizing this for the next 30 to 45 days. Um, you can use this as a base for something else. You know, so it's tomato soup today. Tomorrow could be pasta sauce. I could throw some um, red pepper, green pepper, mushrooms, some more garlic. I can make this into a kind of a vegetable pasta sauce kind of thing. I could turn this into another soup. I throw some beans and some veggies in here. Now I got a minestrone. So you can use it for a lot of different things. It, you would want to simmer it for about a half an hour. I mean, it could, sit all, it could sit here all day. Once it gets to the point where I've got all the tomato product in there, everything's in there, everything's incorporated, I'm gonna bring it to a slow boil, I'm gonna let it simmer for about 35, 30 minutes or so, and then I'm gonna take, take it off the heat. I'm gonna blend it somehow, some way, and then I can serve it right then and there. Everything that we've got, everything that I showed you today is very accessible in the grocery store. All the canned tomato products, obviously the carrots, celery, and onions, all the dried spices, very common stuff. Um, you know, just the, the cooking utensils, and that's why I tried to kind of make this as versatile as possible. So whatever you've got at home, you know, if you've got a knife, a cutting board, a pot, and a stove, you can make this work. It's very simple. We had no expectations. We didn't know how many people were going to show up, if anyone was going to show up. So really, thank you guys. Come next week if you're um, at all intrigued. Ben will be here. I will be here again. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to assist Ben, but I just want to kind of be here for support. Um, and then pay attention to um, social media. I know we're going to announce it. Um, if you guys are coming here on a regular basis, there's going to be flyers out front that are, that, are, that are going to continue to announce all the events that we're doing. And so this is the inaugural video event, but we're planning on doing this every two to three weeks right here, live and in person. So Cox has generously offered to fit, put these finished product videos up on their community channel. So and Trish Rooney, she's an excellent person. So let's give, you know, give Trish a round of applause because none of this would happen. Um, I'm gonna start dishing out some soup. We got it on a cart. There's spoons. So there's gonna, you guys are gonna have a little, little ramekin uh, of soup. And uh, give it a whirl. We have a gallon of soup, so we're not gonna run out.